Hi, and welcome back to AI Conversations. My name is Kelsey, and today I'm going to be talking to Mathieu, who is a senior machine learning engineer here at User Testing. So welcome to the show. Thank you, Kelsey. Nice to meet you. Mathieu, could you tell us a little bit about you and your role in developing AI and ML solutions here at User Testing? Yeah, sure. So I've been working the last five years uh, as an AI lead at Testapic, which is the French remote user testing leader. And uh, we are now uh, part of a bigger family. So I'm most specifically working on the text processing area or natural language processing NLP, uh, where you currently see uh, lots of movement uh, with the, the large language model, all the hype around that. So I'm, you know, in the middle of all of that, which is quite interesting and amazing. So to to really level set our discussion, can you teach us a little bit about the different types of machine learning? And you can keep it pretty pretty high level for those of us who are just starting to get get familiar with this. Okay, yeah. So in the machine learning world, you have many different types of algorithm, and that can be categorized uh, in a few ways. You you're mostly hearing about supervised versus unsupervised learning. So usually supervised learning is just learning from labeled data. So usually that data is labeled by humans. So saying like you have uh, images of uh, cats and dogs, which is the most famous example I could give. Uh, then the model is trained to learn what is a cat and what is a dog on the picture based on the cat and dog labels that humans have been uh, set up next to images. Uh, then the model learned on that, uh, and uh, so this is actually the definition of supervised, which is the most famous or easy to explain one. And um, you also have unsupervised learning, which is also widely used, uh, especially today with deep learning algorithms that we'll get back into it later. But um, with unsupervised learning, you don't need labels. Uh, you just feed raw data to a model and then it tries to learn patterns within that data, clusterize the data. And I mean, it, it is able to also make categories or things like that just based on the raw data it sees without having the labels. And it's actually very powerful because labeling is a complex task. I mean, you need uh, people to do that. You need money also. And uh, it, it's very time consuming. So unsupervised learning tends to be more widely used right now. Or it starts being the new way of doing. So you started talking about this, but um, which types of machine learning are you using at user testing today? And and how is how are these uh, machine learning algorithms actually helping researchers with insight generation or any part of their workflow? Okay, yeah, we are using supervised learning quite a lot. Uh, unsupervised too, but we like very simple use cases, like you have a text, you want to have the sentiment, uh, positive, negative, neutral of the text. So this is definitely supervised learning using labels. We manually annotated some, some data. And um, since we are um, a lot working with text, not only, but a lot still, uh, of course, uh, we are using lots of supervised algorithm to label or to, to extract information from the text to categorize the information. And um, this is the, the kind of algorithms I'm actually mostly working on uh, at, at user testing uh, within the machine learning team. And about your second question about how ML can help customers uh, with research insights generation. So um, I would say that there is one very obvious use case, uh, which is um, helping customers and also UX researchers to um, save lots of time uh, analyzing the data. So at user testing, we record sessions for, for in study, you have recording sessions for from participants and you have you, you expect also people to speak out loud and this is recorded and then transcribed into text. So you have lots of text data and lots of information that is written by customer or said by customers that you have to process. And this takes lots of time for a UX researcher or a customer to analyze. So just think about 10 videos of 20 minutes each, for example, it's just a long time just watching all the content categorizing the stuff manually um, and uh, 
the most obvious uh, use case there is definitely automate that uh, uh, time-consuming part of the workflow. And it, also doing that has a very huge impact because imagine you can just generate uh, a report uh, of everything at once using AI that you are then able to review. Uh, you can review the sources uh, individually to, to make sure that what the AI generated was actually correct. So this is the superpower we want to give to the customers, uh, like being able to go very fast, seeing everything generated by AI and let them decide what they want to do with it. Uh, or the first, maybe they want to just take that as it is. And then uh, otherwise, uh, they can still deep dive into the underlying data uh, to, to get more from it. So this is the best use case um, with insights generation for today at user testing. So what about things like natural language processing or NLP? Yeah, I mean, in this area, the specific area um, had lots of change uh, recently uh, that happened with the, the large language models, definitely. And um, there is one particular reason that wh wh why it's so powerful, actually. Because now imagine that you have lots of companies that are very domain specific, not related to text. Maybe they are, but uh, they they have very specific data for their very specific use case that are not available to the the rest of the world. Um, like in the defense or security industry, they have their own data that is confidential. They still have to build the models on, on their own. They, they will not rely on large language models that are trained on data that has no meaning for in, in this area. So it, if in this area, I mean, in, in, in the specific companies that, that rely on their on confidential data or very domain specific, um, this large language model might be a new starting point, but they are not replacing lots of the past work, I think. What happens with NLP, on the other hand, is that it's a little bit different. It's all about natural language understanding. So it means every company that has text data or transcript data, um, they before they create product features, they innovate with certain features, they first need an intermediate brick, which is an AI that, or process that understands the text before you can take the output of that understanding and, and make something out of it. And understanding text, understanding language is something universal. It, it's not something domain specific. I mean, understanding a text, making a summary out of it, it's an, a, a natural a human process that you want to, to repeat. And it's actually the same process from one company to another. So if you have one day immediately access to a model that understands your text, whatever the domain is, Okay, it might require some fine tuning maybe for your domain, but usually it's already able to be that super power brick that uh, that is in the middle of everything. So NLP was a very huge uh, machine learning area. Uh, it has lots of different applications and then you have sentiment analysis, text information extraction, which is very complex actually to build that yourself with classic approaches and summarization today. Now, if you have that new uh, LLM NLP brick, it just replace it can replace actually all of that because it it was all, all the complexity was about understanding the language and it's even working multilingual. So, um, so it changes. So so the NLP field is completely changed with these new large language models like ChatGPT or Llama two from Meta, uh, and. Yeah, it, it, it started. It's starting having a huge impact on on the industry and on the way we are uh, seeing the the job of a data scientist specialized in NLP. So that brings me to my next question, which is how has how has your job specifically changed? How's your day to day life changed in recent months? Yeah, it has changed completely for the good. I hope, but yeah, I mean the. Um, as I said, I, I was working already on NLP for a few years. So I was specialized in building algorithms uh, that extract information from text out of tra session transcript uh, from use from participants that, that participate to a study. So we extracted the, the, the information from the transcript 
we made sentiment analysis, categorization. One of the main um, feature we wanted to create, so the, the final, the ultimate goal we wanted to have is create automated insights. So a, a direct insight summary of everything. But at, at that time, like two years ago, we were it was totally impossible for us thinking about an AI that actually writes down the text in natural language. Like it says the three users out of 10 says blah, 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 blah. I mean, we had the, just the idea already of categorizing text and clipping the text, selecting the interesting parts of it and showing that to the customers were already a killer feature for people. And, they, and from the UX research we did on the product, it was already considered as a killer feature for the customers. And now we just wake up one day, you see ChatGPT, you make some experiment with it. It's, and it's working so great. I mean, definitely not perfect. We can get back on it later. It has limitations. But actually, it still did the job significantly better than everything that we could have been, that we were doing for a few years before using classical models. So... I can still I can say it's replaced a little bit my job as a data scientist specializing in NLP, but finally not because it just changes completely the way I'm working. I'm more focusing on evaluating what I'm working with. I'm evaluating the model itself, the output of it. Get sure that it actually gets the answer you want. It does not hallucinate. And thinking about the scientific procedure of analyzing all of that is is still part of the data scientist's job. And you just have to work with it. And still, if you're not happy with the results, you can still start fine-tuning the models that are available for fine-tuning. There, you get back into your classic data scientist job of training models. So it's just replacing a little bit some some parts of the of the work. And I really feel extended. Like I have far more opportunities opening and thinking that it will also improve on time uh, is even more exciting for me. So thank you. That's all really exciting. It makes me really excited for what what can come in the future. Um, but it also makes me wonder, you know, how you and the team evaluate emerging technologies and decide what's the best one to use or figure out how they can be used in the user testing platform. So um, the way we are working today, I mean, with all these new innovations all around, uh, first, we have to stay informed on time on everything that is happening in the field. So it's very important, especially for LLMs and in and, and the NLP field, uh, because it's evolving so fast. So you have to, to, to read the news about that and scientific papers also that get out. Uh, there's a lot actually being written at the moment, especially in evaluating the output of large language models, etc. So there's lots happening in research. So you really have to keep focused on what's happening uh, and uh, so that we don't miss opportunities about that. Uh, then all these opportunities, all these are opportunities actually for us to be used for, for user testing. And once we've all uh, been reading that documentation and we all know about the last available models, then we can start, we make this final decision and start working on something that we put into production, whatever it is using a third party tool LLM using an API, a simple use case, or whatever it is actually in-house. Uh, um, I mean, putting an, a model uh, in-house in production uh, and fine-tuning it. I mean, these are definitely very important choices to make. Do we depend on a third-party service? Do we prefer staying open source? But then we have to manage all the infrastructure, all the costs that are coming with it. Is it actually cheaper than do, uh, than actually just using the API. Maybe the, uh, the API third-party service is charging you far more than uh, than all the efforts you can put and money into housing your own model. So these are all uh, issues to take into consideration. It's actually interesting. It's also part of our job and it's it makes the team uh, focused all together on that and it creates nice, nice discussions. Before we wrap up, do you have any final thoughts for our audience? I would say uh, get ready for uh, for a new revolution of AI applications. I think we should expect more groundbreaking stuff around AI uh, in the next few years. Or it, it, it went so fast last year. I think we would definitely have to learn working alongside and also together with the new AIs uh, in many areas in the industry. Be sure to follow All Things AI on Insights Unlocked to learn from experts across product, UX, engineering, marketing, and more.